could you talk us through a little bit about these solutions that you suggest, which, because yes, you know, certainly governments need to do something and companies need to do something, and that's absolutely key. But because that's, you know, we are the Wild West and it's taking some time, I think we have to, as individuals and as parents, intervene and implement some of the changes that you suggest, whether it's self-binding or pursuing pain or pursuing connection or radical honesty, as you suggest. Can you talk us through these sort of your top five solutions to this? Sure. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, I, I outline the kind of clinical approach that we have seen be successful in our clinic um, in, in hopes that that people can implement it themselves in their own lives and, and see if it works for them. Uh, I use a dopamine acronym. So D stands for data. This is where we just ask people to identify what they're using, how much and how often, whether it's pornography or alcohol or cannabis or, or sugar. Um, and this, this functions in two ways. Number one, it allows me to know what the patient is doing, but it also allows the patient to know because uh, there's a funny way in which we lose the ability to see our own behavior when we're chasing dopamine. And we lose the sense of true cause and effect. We, we don't really see uh, its true impact on our lives. But when we stop it for a period of time, which is the main intervention, um, we're able to recapture that. So you know, the, just gathering the data is the first thing. The O of dopamine is having patients identify why they use, I think, you know, so that we can understand what they're getting out of it that's positive. The P stands for problems. What are the problems associated with it? Often with kids, the only problem they identify is that their parents don't want them to use it. Um, but, you know, that's a problem, right? If they have a good, healthy attachment with that parent, they they want the relationship to go well too. So we, we kind of use that. But another big problem is, again, tolerance and the drug stops working over time, turns on them, does the opposite. So we kind of talk through that, talk about the pleasure pain balance. And then the A of the dopamine acronym stands for abstinence. And this is where we invite our patients to do an experiment where they would abstain from their drug of choice for 30 days. Now, if it's cannabis or alcohol or cocaine, that's sort of straightforward. But you're right, if it's sex, it's like, well, what, is, what does that mean? Typically for sex, we would say no, organ or, no orgasms with yourself or anybody else for 30 days. If it's a food problem, we might ask them to identify sugar as the main problem or ultra processed food of any sort as the main problem and have them eliminate that for 30 days. Um, you know, if it's, uh, let's say, a workaholism problem, maybe they would uh, sort of eliminate working outside of certain time periods for 30 days or abstaining from certain types of work or mediums or abstain from travel or something like that. And then we always warn patients that they're going to feel worse before they feel better. And this is probably the most important thing that we say. Again, if you go back to that pleasure pain balance, when you immediately re remove the reward, those gremlins that have accumulated on the pain side of the balance will smash it down to the side of pain. Patients will go into withdrawal. Again, the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance or behavior are psychological, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, craving. But if patients can just get through the first 10 to 14 days, it gets so much easier. And when they get out of that vortex of craving, they begin to feel better, less anxious, less depressed, but also very importantly, they begin to have more cognitive clarity on the behavior itself. I can't tell you how many patients who do the 30 day dopamine fast say, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much energy and time I put into using that substance. And now that I'm out of sort of the pull of that black hole, um, of craving, it seems almost surreal to me. So it's like they, they don't even recognize themselves. That's a really important moment. The other thing that happens with that 30 day fast is that patients are able to say, oh, you know, I thought that cannabis was helping me sleep, but now I'm sleeping so much better. This kind of realization that, um, that it wasn't actually doing what they thought it was in the moment it was working to, uh, restore the balance, which gave them relief. So that part's real. But the cumulative effect was just to accumulate uh, more gremlins on the pain side of the balance. So, so that's really like the key intervention. The rest of the acronym, um, M stands for mindfulness. As you know, mindfulness is the ability to observe our thoughts and feelings without judging them, but also without running away from them. 
And that's a really important exercise. When we can't reach for our drug of choice, then that's a wonderful opportunity to practice mindfulness and see how the craving can sort of wash over us, but then dissipate on its own without our having to actually respond to it. It's a really important moment. Um, Insight, the I stands for insight. I've talked a little bit about that, but again, those aha moments, not just that we're vulnerable to that particular drug, but also triggers. So really, another really fascinating finding in neuroscience is that not only do we get a dopamine spike, you know, initially in response to something that's rewarding or reinforcing, but we have a learned cycle around it. Whereas if we see a reminder of that drug, we get a little dopamine spike followed by a little dopamine deficit state that then sets up the craving to make us want to do the work to get the drug itself. So for example, that vibration that we feel in our pockets that we got an alert um, basically gives us a little dopamine spike followed by a little mini dopamine deficit state, gremlins on the pain side of the balance, that sets up the craving that makes it very hard not to then reach for the phone and look at what, what is incoming. So those kinds of behavior loops that are driven by this physiologic urge to restore homeostasis are very important to recognize, which then gets this idea of self-binding.